Hello, and welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. The topic for this month's show is the birth, life, and death of a star. And here to talk to us about it is Ken Burton from the Warren Astronomical Society. Ken, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Well, there's a lot of stuff in the universe. You know, planets, stars, galaxies. Where did that all come from? Well, um, you see, there's actually two things in space. There's matter or energy. So either you have energy or you have matter. And when the Big Bang occurred initially, it was when all the energy was combined in a very small area and it just gave up, gave it up. And that's the Big Bang. And what happened was there were small particles made that initially electromagnetically drew to one another. And when they were big enough, they started using gravity. So if you want to talk about the fundamentals of it, that's where it all starts. Now, the interesting factor that goes with that quickly is that light-emitting matter it makes up only 5% of the universe of matter of any sort. The rest is either dark matter or dark energy. Dark energy probably takes up somewhere around 65% of the universe, maybe a shade more. And dark, uh, that's dark energy, rather. Dark matter takes up around 25 or 26% of the universe. Now, what do we know about the two of them? Not a whole lot. We're still trying to determine exactly what that is. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you look at this particular, uh, this first slide here, that is actually a composite of how the Big Bang expansion occurred. There was just a, virtually nothing uh, till about um, about 400 million uh, years, 400, uh, 400, uh, billion, 400 million years after the first big, after the Big Bang. Okay. All right. So then what happened with this electromagnetic stuff going on, this stuff started attracting to one another. And once it got big enough and it had enough mass, you now had mostly hydrogen and some helium. It's said that the, a star is, all, the, the, even the oldest stars are made up of 25. Oh, it's like there, iron there's or silicon. There's no trace. They're, nope. they're, they're, just, okay. they're just very, 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 very minor as that. So what now happens is you've got this tremendous amount of pressure going on on the objects so that, for example, something as big as the moon or the earth would become a sphere because it has to become a sphere. That's what happens to big objects. As the gravity pulls equally from all directions. All directions, and that's why you get a sphere. Now, what happens in the inside of it is another story. What you're having in the place where the star develops it's very massive, very much more massive than any of the planets or the, the, the satellites or anything like that. And what you start to have is, is thermal nuclear reaction. Thermal nuclear reaction is when hydrogen is turning into helium, basically. Okay, so what you're talking about now is that it's turning from one to the other. And it needs to for the star to stay stable. It has got, to fight the inward pull of gravity. You've got the inward pull of gravity and the thermal nuclear reaction pushes it out. So that's what you get, all right? That's your equilibrium of a star. Exactly. Okay. Now, other elements are also formed, but they're formed in such traces it is. But again, you have different types of stars. And the, and the metallic makeup of stars generally has something to do with which ones they are. For okay. example, um, most stars, as time goes along, They'll explode, all right, or they'll collapse in completely. But what's going to happen is that's when the rest of the uh, elemental stuff begins, when at that point in time, mostly from an exploding star. Some of it is done from a dying star. Now, here, here you have, if you don't, and you had asked the question, I know that you talked about hydrogen and, and helium, what happens when the hydrogen goes is one of the things. I know that maybe in your second set, this is a perfect lead in for it. Okay. All right. So when the hydrogen uh, is all turned into helium, the thermal nuclear reaction stops. What happens? Gravity takes over. So what happens is the star collapses. And what happens, just like you rub your fingers together, like your hands together, you get heat, do you not? Sure. That's what's happening with all the helium atoms 
are colliding with one another, and they're heating up. And because they're heating up, it starts to expand again. Okay, they start to fuse into something else. That's right. What happens? They do that, but they don't do they. If, when the helium is runs out, it starts to collapse again, and then you get the heavier elements that start to do it. And once you get to the point of iron, you're done. So that's pretty much the sequence. But there's a lot of different types of stars. So let's talk about um, let's see, uh, taking taking into effect. Uh, a, a planet. Uh, a planet can be gaseous, right? Sure, like Jupiter or Saturn. Jupiter is. We're gaseous too. We have uh, an interesting display of gas. We have high oxygen. We have nitrogen. Mm -hmm. We have carbon dioxide. We have lots of gases. We also have water, which also has is hydrogen and oxygen, H2O. Right. Okay. So the universe is made up of this stuff in different degrees and different amounts. Sure. The Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, uh, that, that particular uh, just tells you where the stars are in their lifetime pretty much. Uh, what you look at is you've got, there's a phrase called, oh be a fine girl, kiss me. That's right. The O stars are blue, hot, big stars, very short-lived. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you go down the list a little bit, you got the B stars. Uh, that are also pretty hot and such, and the A stars. And then you get to the uh, uh, F stars, and then yep. you have the G stars. And our sun is a G star. star. Right, which would fall it into the, you to the see yellow. It on the, that's right. They exactly. would be yellow, okay? And then you move, after that, you go to the K stars, which, um, again, are a little bit toward the red. And mm -hmm. then you get the red dwarfs, which are the, uh, are the M stars. The M stars. Now, the interesting feature about this particular thing is that what you have is you have most of the stars in the universe are in the red. Most of them. As really? a matter of fact, when you go from O to B, there's 14 times as many B stars as there are O stars. And 14 times, times as many A stars as there are B stars. Okay? And... So on and so forth, 14 times, 14 times, 14 times, 14 times. So you're talking about lots of red stars, yeah. lots and lots of red stars. But it's interesting how they follow that same progression. They, exactly. Now, the other factor involved here is when a star moves off the main sequence and becomes a red giant, which is what's going to happen to our sun. Okay, let me, uh, that just gives you an idea of the... You also have other areas. You've got white dwarfs. That's the death of them over there. They're, this is not where they appear. This is what their lifetime is all about in the, okay. these, this picture. Uh, we all know that stars die and the type of death along with what's left over. The pics indicate the basic results due to the mass of the star. On the left there, you see the supermassive star end, a supernova in the Crab Nebula. Right, M1. Yep. M1. Yep, in Taurus. What's going to happen to us is we're not big enough to explode. Oh, okay. not all stars end as a supernova? No. As a matter of fact, only the very massive, initially white and uh, blue stars do that. Now, of course, when you have one that, that transposes into a red giant like Betel Betelgeuse, it's very massive, but it's going to explode as well because of the mass. When the collapse comes, the gravity is so great that the pressures become so great that it explodes. But it has to be very massive in order for that to happen. Uh, our sun is the picture on the right. That is the ring nebula. What our star will do someday. What's going to happen is it's going to become a red giant, not like at the order of Betelgeuse, but it's going to become a red giant and then What's going to happen as it collapses is going to feed off all of that material, and that's all that color that's there. Just Those sort of all, puffing off its, that's what's its atmosphere? Going, that's what happens. Now, that stuff over there on the right can gather again as the what stuff in the left. And what happens if you have enough stuff and you've got gravity, what you're going to do is you're going to get another star. Make a new star right. with all of the elements that were produced in the explosion of the previous right. star. Yeah. Now, the, 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 the smaller stars that become the ring, uh, that stuff dissipates. It's not likely to really become another star, but it could, you know, a, a, a small one perhaps. But, mm. but the ones on the other side, that stuff, the Crab Nebula stuff, that's 
all the elements that we have are in there because when it explodes, it produces the heavier elements in large quantities. Now, we as a sun, our sun is a probably third generation star stuff. That's what we are made of. Which is why we have all of these heavier elements. Exactly. That's, that's the reason for life. And what you have is an exploding star will produce all that, and then when gravity works together, you're going to get another star. Now, interestingly enough, remember when I said to you that the stars that were the first to explode were the blue and the, the O and the B stars and the A stars, right. which are white. Uh, they have a very, very extreme temperature, and the burning goes on pretty radically. And the burning that goes on very radically is what's producing the stuff that's going on, okay? The furnace. The furnace of it is what's yep. doing it, mm -hmm. all right? So um, we are third generation star stuff. And oh, by the way, the, the farther the star is up on that Oatsburn Russell diagram, the less lifetime it has because it's burning in a very, very high temperature. Talking about the stars, blue stars have a surface temperature of 55,000 degrees Fahrenheit. They need to do that to counterbalance the pull of gravity. So exactly, they must pretty much. Massively burn their right. fuel to keep an equi right. equilibrium. Right, so they don't live that long. So when if you get to a yellow star, well, the yellow star has a much longer lifetime because it's not as hot as a white star, and it's usually a little bit smaller. But just the same, our sun has a 10 billion year lifetime. A white star like Sirius probably on the age range of a billion, maybe, all right? Uh, a star like Rigel, Rigel uh, or Deneb, one of those two, are stars that will only live a few million years, or 100 million years, if you want to call it that, which is a sure. matter of no time and space. Right, right. Okay? The smaller stars, they will cool and turn. Eventually, after they become a, a red giant, they will collapse again, and eventually they'll continue to collapse, and... That'll be it. There'll be a piece of iron, if you want to call it that, and they will cool, and there'll just be something out in space. So there's your stellar evolution. You've got a nebula, and if you look at the top, these are the main sequence stars. That's the main group. Okay. Down below a little bit. Oh, by the way, a, a red dwarf, by the way, can live 150 billion years or more. We don't have any. They could burn for forever. They're going to last a lot longer than you think, but that's the red ones. Interesting. All right, so in the main sequence, we got our sun, and then after it runs out of its fuel, or the hydrogen turns into helium and expands into a red giant, and then what happens is it collapses, and then it starts to break up, and that's why you get a planetary nebula. They're just called planetary nebula because when you look in the telescope, they look, they look like round a like a planet. Right. Sure. So the planetary nebula is the result of the red giant dying, and then... Whatever's left over becomes a white dwarf. Here's a really interesting fact, though. In the middle of that planetary nebula is a white dwarf, actually. Uh, the temperature of that white dwarf in, the planet, in a regular planetary nebula could be 250 um, million degrees. I wow. mean, it's just... it's Phenomenal. Phenomenal, yeah. All right? yeah. because it's a pressure cooker. Got it? Burning, yeah. all that mm -hmm. other stuff. Now, when you go into the nebula with a high-mass star, and that's a star that is generally in the range of about, uh, they say, 6 to 10 or more uh, suns in okay. mass. All right? So it goes into a red giant stage eventually because, it, because, again, it's the collapse and the burning, and it expands. And then it falls in on itself, like I said earlier, and it keeps falling in because nothing can stop it. Okay? And it keeps going down and in, 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 and then boom. There you go. Okay. That's what you got. All right? And then, of course, what you'll get is you got a lot of junk out there that is going to start cracking with each other again, and you're going to have the process another... process starts all It's going to start all, all over, over again. again. Wow. Let me see if there's a... Let's see if there's something. Yeah. There you have it. You have a low-mass star, a brown dwarf, Jupiter. The one on the top is the sun, okay? Uh -huh. And a low-mass star would be generally red for obvious reasons. Um, the, then you have a brown dwarf that is just above... What you'd have is you had a planet. So, in other words, there's no thermal nuclear reaction going on beyond the brown dwarf. There is thermal nuclear action going on on the brown dwarf as the low mass, as our sun. But when you get down to, like, Jupiter, Jupiter would have to be ten times its size 
in order to become a There's product. not enough mass there There's to ignite stuff. the nuclear furnace. Right. Yeah. However, it's very rich in hydrogen and helium and all those other things. It just won't ignite. And of course, your Earth is another factor involved. Totally. But it's pretty, pretty hot in, in this internal part of the Earth also. It is. There are some objects in space do not have an internal core like our Earth. Uh, Venus absolutely does. We're wondering about Mercury, probably does. But something as small as the moon, no. There's nothing going on inside. That's already cool. That's, down that's it. it yeah. Could have a little something, but we can't tell because we can't get in there. Right. Okay, so to go on, um, there you have, the next is, this, is a comparison of Sirius to the sun. Sirius has a brightness that is 20 times more than the sun and also a temperature that exceeds it by about 4,000 K. So that kind of gives you the first summation of what we were doing, yeah. and there you go. Any questions on that? Well, I'm sure there are, but right now, Ken, we have to take a quick break. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you have any questions, uh, please send us an email. Uh, the address, as always, is down at the bottom of your screen. And coming up next with Term of the Month is Stephen. Thanks, Don. The term of the month is solar flare. On Friday, January 20th, a solar flare erupted on the sun. It was classified as an M 5.5 level flare, M for moderately strong. There are five classes of flares, A, B, C, M, and X. The event letter has a number ranging from one to just under 10, except that X class flares have no upper limit. In fact, in, 20, in 2003, there was a flare classed as an X-28, though with some uncertainty. Satellite instruments were overloaded. The sun emitted an X-1 flare this past Halloween. The classification system follows a power law. There are more weaker flares than powerful ones. Flares occur in active regions and often near sunspots where magnetic fields link the solar interior with the photosphere and corona. The same energy, energy may also release a coronal mass ejection. Flares produce light across the spectrum from radio through visible and x-rays to gamma rays. Most flares require special instruments to see them at all. And that's the term of the month, solar flare. Back to you, Don. Thanks, Stephen. We're back. Our topic is the birth, life, and death of a star. And with us is Ken Burton from the Warren Astronomical Society. So, Ken, where do we go from here? Well, what we're going to do is real briefly, we're going to cover the fact that when you have a, a, a proton and a neutron, you've got yourself a hydrogen. And yep. what, what that becomes is, is after the, the decay, you have what is known as a deuteron. And the deuteron actually combines two of those, it make helium. So that's the process that we're talking about there. Um, the, uh, it, 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 the next stage is the phase is called the helium flash. Things are not hot that the star is able to fuse these heavier helium nuclei into larger nuclei like carbon and then oxygen. Although through something called triple alpha process, and this means that the star has a whole new source of fuel and all the helium for making uh, for making for billions of years. Um, you can also look at this uh, star begins pulsating as it runs through its final energy reserve, entering what we call a, a horizontal branch. And this time it becomes smaller, hotter and bluer until much of the helium has been fused into larger nuclei. Once the core is predominantly carbon and oxygen, with just a shell of helium around it and a shell of hydrogen around that, the star has very little material left to burn, so the core will collapse and it enters an asymptotic, it's asymptotic uh, giant branch. Uh, this means it grows rapidly, becomes a giant star again until the last burst of energy eject the outer layer, pushing it away from the core and back into the interstellar medium, leaving only a very, very hot bare core behind around the size of the Earth. So that would be a white dwarf then? That would be a white dwarf. Okay. Now, the, for a high mass star, ones with much more massive than our sun, 
things are quite a bit different. Uh, their demise is not so quiet. Big stars go out with a bang. Things start out normally with a gas cloud collecting under the influence of gravity. And it is simply that this cloud is much larger than those that form the low mass stars, so it will contain much more mass. More mass means more gravity, which means the force pushing inward is much stronger and the star gets much hotter. The hotter temperature means faster fusion, which generates greater uh, outward pressure to counteract the greater inward pull of gravity. And that this means that they use up the hydrogen in their cores in around a fleeting 100 million years, or even 10 million if it's big enough. So you can see the lifetime is short for mm -hmm. these big stars. Uh, then, however, the core of the high mass star continues to compress, it gets much hotter than the core of the low mass star, and it becomes able to fuse helium nuclei to form carbon, and then oxygen, uh, then neon, then silicon, each heavier nucleus being relegated to a smaller and smaller region of the core that is hot enough to fuse it. And all the way to the center sits the heaviest element that can be fused within a star, which is iron. Uh, this occurs at diff in these different layers, each performing a particular type of fusion with no fuel remaining. Moving along, here is where gravity wins the flight and the star collapses into a single, within a single second. The outer layer is bouncing off the core and triggering an explosion, thus ejecting all the heavy nuclei the star has created in, out into space. This is an awesome event, and one of the most violent energetic phenomena in the universe, and it's called a supernova. Supernova generates such an unbelievable burst of energy that in a brief moment, dozens of elements heavier than iron can also be synthesized. Nickel, copper, zinc, silver, gold, and any element with an atomic number greater than 26 is made either of uh, in a supernova or a rare event like a collision of two neutron stars, which we discussed, that's another aspect of it. Lower mass stars that begin with less than about eight solar masses leave behind white dwarfs because once reduced to its lighter Earth-sized core is not enough gravity to overcome the uh, electron degeneracy. Uh, in other words, the white dwarf will become kind of like one giant met uh, metallic solid with the electron clouds around nuclei pushing against each other and preventing additional co collapse. So it ends up with something, as you mentioned earlier, about the size of the Earth? Right. Approximately? Right. Yep. But for a high-mass star, there, upon its death, the core of the star is above the Chandrasekhar limit, which means it is massive enough for a supernova to occur. One of two things will be left behind. The core at around between 1.4 and 3 solar masses will be there, and the object remains a ball of neutrons punched up together uh, about the size of uh, the city of New York, for example. And uh, the high mass star, again, we talked about, but even more mirac miraculously, if the core of the star is above about three solar masses, even the outward pressure of the neutrons pressing right up against each other or neutron degeneracy pressure is not enough to stop the immense gravity and the neutrons will be crushed together as the remaining mass collapses into a single point of infinite density. The entire mass of the star's core combined with zero volume. This object is called a black hole. And virtually, that's what you're going to get from the two different... Uh, situations. You're going to get either get, you're going to get a white dwarf as the result, or you're going to get a black hole. You might get a neutron star, which is uh, a little bit uh, less compact than a, uh, a black hole. I was mentioning to you before, uh, the rotation can be up to 500 times a second of a neutron star. It's amazing. It, it certainly is, and we could probably sit here for an hour Absolutely. and talk about it, and I would love it personally. But I do want to thank you for coming in and presenting to our viewers the birth, life, and death of a star. If you uh, would like to uh, check out our club website, uh, the address is right down there at the bottom of the screen. And to finish out the show, as always, we have What's Up in the Night Sky with Stephen. Thanks, Don. What's Up in the Night Sky for February 2022? A month past the solstice, days are short and getting longer in the north, while south of the equator, days are long, getting shorter. The sun has been relatively quiet, with fewer sunspots. The solar minimum was at about the start of 2020, 
and the number of sunspots has been climbing since. The red line shows the numbers of sunspots expected, to, uh, how they're expected to change. The current cycle, which is cycle 25, should see peak sunspot, sunspots sometime in 2025. That's easy enough to remember. Will cycle 25 follow this nice smooth predicted line? Cycle 24 on the left didn't. Note that cycle 25 is predicted to be longer than cycle 24. 14 years instead of 10. A normal cycle is 11 years. Solar cycle prediction is quite new. There may be other surprises. Shown below uh, is a small graph of sunspots since 1750, which is shortly before I was born. February starts with a new moon on the 1st. First quarter is on the 8th, full moon is on the 16th, and third quarter is on the 23rd, which sets us up for March starting its month on the 1st with a new moon. And that's what you expect with a 28-day February that starts on a named quarter. Saturn is in Capricornus. Uh, it has superior conjunction February 4th, so it's not going to be very visible. This is the morning of the 26th, so Saturn is now in the morning uh, by then, uh, after a superior conjunction. Saturn is still pretty close to the Sun, so we're not likely to easily see it. Mercury is in Sagittarius and moves to Capricornus, and in this image is in Capricornus. It's probably better at the beginning of the month when it's closer to Mars and Venus. Pluto is in Sagittarius, but really you have to have a telescope and the sun is unforgiving in the morning, so best wait until July to see Pluto. Mars and Venus are in Sagittarius, bright nearly two hours before sunrise. Now, shortly after sunset on the 1st of February, we see Uranus in Aries, and we're looking at Uranus with binoculars, and it sets around midnight. Also here are Neptune and Jupiter in Aquarius, much closer to the sun. Jupiter has superior conjunction coming on March 5th, so which is real soon, while Neptune is also lost behind the sun on March 13th. Note Ceres above Uranus and Neptune to the right of Pallas. And that's what's up in the night sky for February 2022. Remember, we don't charge for this show, but we may tax your brain.